Do we have any first through sixth graders in the house this morning? Let's try that again. Do we have any first through sixth graders in the house this morning? Okay. I see you're working very hard to behave yourselves. <laughs> Outstanding and well done. Um, well, my name is Todd Malone, and it is a pleasure to bring you God's word this morning. Before we do that, I received a couple of emails over the last day or two um, pointing out that churches have been in, churches around the country have been invited to pray for our president today. Um, as I read that email, I, I was convicted. Scripture is very, very clear that we are to pray for leadership. Um, and it occurred to me that that would be a good way for us to start, not just for our president, but for the leadership uh, at a national level, a state level, and a local level, uh, that we may live and minister in peace, is what the scripture says. So uh, would you join me in prayer and praying for our leadership? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have placed us in this place at this time. And you have placed us here that we might serve you, that we might minister in your name, that your name would be lifted up and glorified. And this morning we have been reminded that we need to pray as you command us to for the leadership of the country that governs us. And so, Lord, we, we start by praying for the men and women who are in Congress who have been given the task to represent the people from their states and their districts, and Lord, to represent their interests, even above the interests of, their, of the politician who represents them. And Lord, we ask that we would give them the humility to do that and to do that honorably. And Lord, we do pray for our president who has to weigh so many different competing Issues and demands, we cannot imagine what it must be like to have to make so many complex decisions so quickly and very often with limited information. And so, Lord, give him wisdom, give him grace, give him special insight to govern well. Lord, for our Supreme Court, give them the wisdom to make decisions that are honoring to you and pleasing to you and that uphold truth in righteousness. Lord, we pray the same at the state level, that our governors, our representatives, the leaders, the courts, would be people, men and women, who would represent you, your character, and that would honor and glorify you through their actions. And Lord, even at the local level, as the city continues to respond and clean up after the storm that hit us so hard, Local leaders are having to make hard decisions, and we ask that you give them wisdom. Lord, this is not for our glory. This is not for um, our comfort. But your scripture invites us to pray for these things for our peace and our ability to minister well. And so, Lord, that is why we pray. And we put our leadership in your hands that they may honor you in how they lead. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We just need to do that more often, and I appreciate those who sent me uh, those reminders, uh, made me aware of that because I had not been aware of that, and that was, I think that's really helpful, and we should make that a more regular practice here, and uh, we'll try to do that. <sighs> Have you ever been so frightened, so terrified that you just froze? Have you ever been so afraid that you couldn't breathe, that you couldn't think straight, that you couldn't move a muscle, you were just paralyzed? I have a very clear memory of a time that happened to me. When I was first writing this, I was thinking that it happened when I was around junior high, but this morning it's like, no, I know exactly when that happened. It was in the summer between my fifth and sixth grade year. Um, 
My family was out somewhere doing something. I have no idea what they were doing, but we were all in a place that was outdoors, and it was really kind of a cool place, especially when you're that age. It had a whole bunch of trails, like bike trails and stuff that you could run around in, and there was lots of bushes and tall grasses and things like that. So, you know, you could kind of see over those things, but it, parts of the trail would be blocked off, and it was just kind of a fun place to go run around. I remember running around this one corner, and I came face to face with the most terrifying thing I had ever seen in my life to that point. It was small. It was furry. It had a cute nose. <laughs> and yes, it was black and white. It was a small, furry, black and white, cute nose nightmare. Now, apparently, I was the most terrifying thing it had ever seen in its life because it also froze. And we both stood there, motionless, staring at each other like we were gunfighters in the Old West. And the only problem is only one of us had brought a weapon to this fight. And it was not me. And at some point, I started to get feeling and motion back in my legs. And I thought, there is no way you could not put 10,000 apple pies on the other side of that skunk. I am not going forward. The only way I am going is back the way I came. And so I started backing up the way I came. And apparently at that point, that's also when the skunk regained feeling into its legs because it immediately turned and it wasn't to run away. <laughs> and so my family long remembered that as the stinkiest family outing we ever went on. <laughs> Fear can freeze us in our tracks. Sometimes what is staring us down can be so frightening that we can feel completely overcome and as if there is no way that we can take one step forward. And as we are reading through the first five books of the Old Testament, what's often called the Pentateuch, we have come to a passage where Israel is exactly at that point. They are face to face with something that has frightened them so much that they refuse to take one more step. Now, to help us understand what's going on here, let's take a step back and let's look at the big picture and remember what has been going on as we have been reading through the first five books of the Old Testament. The first book, of course, is Genesis. It is about God choosing a people through whom he is going to bless the entire world, and he's going to bless the entire world through them in two ways. One is as they represent God's character to the people around them, the people will be blessed. And second, the Messiah, Jesus, is going to come from, from this, this nation, this people, and he will save the people from their sins. Exodus picks up about 400 years after Genesis ends, and God's people are slaves in Egypt. And in Exodus, God frees his people, and he promises to give them a new home, the promised land. And this will be a place where the people thrive. And so Exodus is about them being freed from slavery. And when Exodus ends, they are out of Egypt, and they are at Mount Sinai, and they are on the way to the promised land, to a new home. Leviticus picks up. Right where Exodus ends, they are at Mount Sinai. And in Leviticus, what God does is God tells the people how a sinful people can relate to a holy God. And then the book of Numbers starts again right where Leviticus picks up. They're still at Mount Sinai. It's one year after they've left Egypt. And in the first part of the book of Numbers, if you've been reading through it, you see that God takes them right to the doorstep of the promised land. And God says, go in. You don't even need to ring the doorbell. This is your home. But 
God's people reject God and they refuse to enter the land. And so in the rest of the book of Numbers, God has them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until there's a new generation that rises up that is able to enter the land. And the book of Numbers is about the cost of disbelief and disobedience. We get to today's passage in Numbers 14. The nation has set out from Mount Sinai. And in chapter 13, they actually arrive at the promised land. They are at the front door. And so they send out 12 spies to check it out. And God actually tells them to do this. But here's what happens. Ten of the spies come back and they give a bad report. They said that the people there are too big for Israel to defeat and the land wasn't worth it. But two of the spies, remember who they are? Joshua and Caleb. Two of the spies come back and they they give an honest and good report. And they say, the land is good. It's worth going into this land. It is worth making this our new home. But the nation stopped, frozen in their tracks, terrified by the report of the ten spies. And so today's passage picks up right there. We see the people doubt God's direction for them. Then we see Joshua and Caleb try to focus the people on God's promise. And finally, we see the very heart of the problem. The people have forgotten God's past. But in the first paragraph, the first four verses, we see the Israelites, both literally and figuratively, doubting God's direction. The people have a choice about whom they're going to believe. It's interesting how the 10 spies say it in chapter 13. They describe the land as a land that would people. It's like a picture of giving chicken McNuggets to a dog. They're going to be gone, out, eaten alive by this land. And the people are either going to believe that report. Or they're going to believe Joshua and Caleb. And we see in verse 1 that they believe the false report of the ten spies. And it says the entire congregation, literally the entire community of Israelites, the entire nation, they wailed in grief and in bitterness because the promised land seemed like it was unreachable. And even if it was, it was undesirable. Who would want to live in a land that devours them? Verse 2, it says, because the people believed the wrong people, the wrong report, and because they didn't trust God, it's the entire community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And this word grumbled is really an interesting word. It occurs frequently throughout Exodus and Numbers, and it always, always refers to complaining against God or against God's representative. And in every single case, it refers to complaining unjustly against God and God's representative. And you see what the substance of their complaint is? Death in Egypt or death in the wilderness would be better than death in the promised land. Spoiler alert. This generation is going to get what they wished for. They are going to die in the wilderness. And it will be the next generation, their children, who will enjoy the promised land. There's a shift in verse 3. The Israelites now reveal that their real problem isn't really with Moses and Aaron. Their real problem is with the Lord. They do not approve of the direction he is leading them. They are convinced that if they follow the Lord, the men will die and the women and children will end up as slaves, which is what it means that they would become prey. Do you see what they're saying in verse 4? It's not just that they want to replace Moses Replacing Moses really means that they are replacing God. And based on verse 3, they know exactly what they are saying. They do not want the Lord's leader or the Lord's promise. They would rather go backward to slavery. Who's this? Get a little more strength in that answer. Pinocchio. 
Why does his, why does his nose look like a tree branch? Because he lied. I see kids raising their hands. That is so good. Well done. Um, because he lied. Now, let's remember what's going on here. Let's remember why he told a lie in this scene. The blue fairy is the one who turned him from a puppet into a boy. And she told him, when she turned him into a boy, that if he was brave, truthful, and unselfish, he would remain a boy. Now, in this scene, the blue fairy finds Pinocchio and asks Pinocchio, why haven't you been in school? And does Pinocchio tell the truth? He tells a lie. Why does he tell a lie? Because he doesn't want the blue fairy to be mad at him and turn him back into a puppet. Have you ever been so afraid of the consequences of doing what is right that you decided to do what was wrong? That is exactly what's happened to God's people in Numbers 14. They were so afraid of doing what God asked them, invited them, opened up for them to do, to go into this land where they would thrive. They were so afraid of the consequences of that that they rebelled and wanted to go in the opposite direction. And the same is true of us. I have been so afraid of telling the truth at times in my life that I have told lies. I've been so afraid of being lonely at times in my life that I kept hanging out with friends that I knew I shouldn't. I have had friends in my life who have told me difficult things that were hard for me to hear, but were designed to help me grow closer to the Lord. But it hurt me so much, and I was so afraid of getting hurt again that I stopped being their friend. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says we should treasure the truth. That some friendships should be avoided. That hurtful words will come from a faithful friend. But we don't always want to go in that direction. We fear that the price is too high. And so we run the opposite way. We are just like the Israelites. Doubting God's direction. But there is a way to overcome that fear that paralyzes. It starts with focusing on God's promise. And that's what we see happening in verses 5 through 9. Moses and Aaron's reaction to the Israelite rebellion was immediate and it was emotional. They fall to the ground. This is awe-filled submission and humility before the Lord. What are they doing here? They are trying to avert God's anger, God's wrath against the people. And then in verse 6, the scene shifts. Now the scene looks at Joshua and Caleb. We saw how Moses and Aaron response. What did Joshua and Caleb do? They react to the Israelites' rebellion in two ways. First, they tear their clothes. This was a physical sign that they were grieved and angry. Sidebar. Kids, do not do this at home. When you are angry with your parents, trust me. Trust me, it will not have the effect that you want. But in their day, this is exactly what you did when you were really, really upset. The second thing that Joshua and Caleb did is they told the truth. When they say that the land was exceedingly good, they use a Hebrew expression that means the land is over the top amazing. You can picture this place. Food is incredible. The weather is unbelievable. It's like San Diego without the traffic. It's the best place you could ever want to live. Everything that God promised is right there. And then in verse 8, Joshua and Caleb get right to the heart of the problem. The Lord promises to give them this land, and they need to trust God's promise. Do you notice how they described the land? It was a land flowing with milk and honey. Have we seen that phrase before? Last week, we looked at Leviticus 20. 
God described the land that he was going to give them as a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a way of saying that this land has everything that we would need and want. And last week we said it's like telling a Texan that this is a land flowing with oil and apple pie. The land will give the Israelites, the Lord will give the Israelites this land if, it says in verse 8, the Lord delights in them. Some of your translations say, if they obey. And the reason they're translated that way is because what will cause the Lord to delight in them is their obedience. Joshua and Caleb are saying, if they go into this land, trusting that the Lord will do what he said he will do, he will give them the land. He will keep his promises. Verse 9 says that the Lord will make their enemies like bread to them. That's just meaning that the Lord is going to make their enemies incredibly easy to defeat. As easy as eating bread. Bread is soft. It's easy to chew. It's easy to swallow. It's not like an overcooked steak that you cut with a chainsaw. This is easy eating. And it's all because the Lord is with them. And remember as we've gone through the first five books of the Bible, what it means when it says that the Lord is with them. It's not implying that sometimes God's around them and sometimes he's off playing golf. This is a way of saying that God is working on the behalf of the Israelites. He's working on behalf of their causes, their purposes. It's saying that their cause, their purpose, and the Lord's causes and purpose are one and the same. And guess what? God is not going to fail in his purposes. And if their purposes are aligned with God's, that means they are not going to fail either. God made promises to his people. God promised them that he would lead them into the land. God promised them that the land would be amazing. It would be everything they needed and everything they wanted in a home. And Joshua and Caleb are simply saying that God is not going to go back on his promises. He is going to do exactly what he said he will do. I want you to stop and think about exactly what God has said he will do for us. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus also said that he is with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Hebrews 13, the Lord says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And Paul promises in Philippians 1 that God will complete the work he has started in you. These are just some of the promises that you can point to and say, that is what God is doing in my life. You can step into obedience that terrifies you because you know that God keeps his promises. He will always be with you. He will never leave you. He will give you abundant life and he will complete his work in you. The Israelites doubted God's direction, so they rebelled. Joshua and Caleb try to refocus them, to get them to focus on God's promise, to encourage them to obey, because God is not going to go back on his promises. Finally, God himself addresses the situation. And he addresses the very core issue. that that, That is that they need to remember God's past. Joshua and Caleb point to God's promise and his ability to bring them into the land. And how do the people respond? Let's kill them. Do you think about what that had to feel like for a second? What does it feel like when you have an entire nation that wants to kill you? Right? There's no place to hide in this situation. It's not like a movie. Two guys are standing right here, and roughly two million people are standing right there. They're not going anywhere. But here's the thing. Joshua and Caleb had less of a chance against the Israelites than the Israelites had against the people that they were afraid of. And that's the point. 
God suddenly makes his power and presence known to everyone that is there. And the people realize that an entire nation against two people is not a fair fight if those two people have God on their side. That nation is grossly outnumbered. In verses 11 and 12, God speaks directly to Moses. And God asks the question, how long will the people despise me? The Hebrew word that's translated despises means to throw something away, to reject it, to treat it disrespectfully. What do you do with a used paper plate? Do you hang it on the wall as artwork? (laughs) Can't wait to go to that house. Um, You throw it away. What do you do with a dead fly? Do you put it in the middle of the table as a centerpiece? No, you throw it away. These are the types of words, the types of images that God is using here. God is saying, he is asking, how long will these people treat me as something that you just throw away? How long will they treat me like I am worthless? And then God asks the punch them in the stomach question. How long will they not believe in him in spite of the signs that he has done among them? Stop and think about that question for a second. What have these people seen? They saw God bring plagues on Egypt. They saw God part the Red Sea and destroy Pharaoh's army. They saw God bring plagues and heal plagues, bring poisonous snakes and heal the bites from poisonous snakes. They saw God provide miraculously food and water when it was needed. And they saw God actually cause the earth to devour people who rebelled against him. What more Do they need to see? And because the people simply will not believe, God tells Moses that he's ready to start over with a whole new people. See, here's the core problem in verse 11. They didn't remember God's past. Or maybe a better way of saying it is that they didn't think that God's past had anything to do with their future. God miraculously cared for and protected his people again and again and again and again. And when it came time to enter the promised land, the people said, but what if he doesn't do it this time? The fundamental failure of the Israelites was that they refused to believe that what God would would do in the future is the same as what he did in the past. They were willing to accept the idea that this time God would let them down. Do you do that? Do we do that? God takes care of us again and again and again. But we say this time, God might let me down. I think it's worth making the conscious effort To remember what God has done for us. That, by the way, is one of the most important reasons that we celebrate communion as we did this morning. Because it forces us to pause and remember what God has done. While we were his enemies, we weren't neutral. We were his enemies. He sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life die on the cross to take the penalty for our sin and be raised from the dead to give us a whole new life in relationship with God. As we say, there is the great exchange if we accept Jesus as our Savior. All the righteousness that he lived and he had as living a perfect life gets credited to us and all of our sin and unrighteousness gets credited to him on the cross. 
if we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. There is nothing that we have done or going to do or will do that will cause God to reject us. Even when horrible things happen to us, and they will, God is able to redeem them. God demonstrates his grace, mercy, faithfulness, and love to us constantly. It's not like he sent his son and then left us on our own afterwards. Can you take a second and think of some of the signs, some of the evidences for what God has done in your life? Certainly there is Christ. And maybe you've experienced miraculous moments, like when you were protected from an accident or healed from something that no one could explain. But I would encourage you to also pay attention to and remember the subtle day-to-day moments. It's in the strength and the courage that God gives you to go through a difficult time. It's in the grace to truly forgive someone who hurt you. It's in the mercy to allow someone to disagree with you without trying to crush them in an argument. Those things do not come naturally to us. They are signs that God is at work in you and God is not done with you. How do you know beyond any question that God will keep his promises to give you an abundant life, to be with you always, to never leave you or forsake you, and to complete the work that he has started in you? There are two answers. The first is this, what he did by giving you Jesus. And the second is what he continues to do as he cares for you and make you like Jesus. What fear are you facing? that makes you want to turn and run from God? What obedience seems so impossible that you doubt God's direction? Well, if Joshua and Caleb could stand here today, they would say, don't let fear keep you from the abundant life. And they would point to God's promises. And if Moses was standing here today, he would say, don't let fear keep you from the obedience that leads to the abundant life. And he would point to God's perfect track record of faithfulness and work for you and in you and assure you that God is going to keep his promises. And that really gets to the point of the message. Remembering God's faithful past moves us toward our promised future. When I had my showdown with the skunk, I felt totally defenseless. The skunk was the only one packing heat. All I wanted to do was go back the way I came. And how did that work out for me? Didn't work out very well for the Israelites either, and it doesn't work out well for us when we want to back away from obedience because we're afraid. See, the big difference between us and my fight with the skunk is that we are not defenseless. The same God who would eventually lead his people to victory and abundance in the promised land is at work in you right now, today. So how do we respond? I'm going to give you some suggestions, as always, but I say this for those who might be new or just need a reminder. On this this bulletin that you received, there's a connection card at the bottom, and on the back, there's a place for you to put down what is the next step that you want to take, whether it's one of the four that you suggested or something else. I encourage you to fill that out and drop it in one of the boxes in the foyer. It's either to my right or to my left. And we as a staff will pray for you as you seek to apply God's word. But here are the four ways that we suggest. One is read Deuteronomy this next week. And if you read Deuteronomy this week, and you can do it in a week, we will have completed reading through the first five books of the Bible together as a church. Second thing I would encourage you to do is tell one person about a fear that you are facing. Every week, I want to reinforce that we do not live the Christian life. We must rely on the people around us. Pray that the Lord will open our eyes 
to the signs of what God is doing in your life and what God has done in your life. Help us to pay attention to how he is at work. And then a good discipline to enter into is to actually keep a list. And start this week even by just writing down five things that you see that God is doing. Evidences that God is faithful to his promises. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, I want to ask the question, why after a sermon like this do we need to pray? We need to pray because every one of us faces fear in some area where we are called to obey. And obedience is a necessary step in the path to an abundant life. So we need to come before the Lord and ask for him to focus us on his promises and to remind us of his faithfulness. These folks are here to pray exactly that with you. If there's a fear that you want us to stand with you in and pray for you about. But we'll pray for you about anything. If you're struggling in a relationship, finances, whatever it may be. But boy, if you do not know the Savior Jesus, we certainly want to introduce you to him. Come forward and let us do that. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Oh, God, you are so good to us. You are so faithful to us. There is not a promise that you have made that you have failed to keep. But Lord, if we are honest, when we are faced with obedience, sometimes it is so frightening to us. We think that the next time, the next step, the next movement forward will be the time that you fail us. Lord, forgive us for our disbelief. Forgive us for our failure to trust that the same God who, take, who took care of us every day leading up to this point is the same God who's going to care for us as we go forward. And Lord, we seek this not for our own glory, but for yours. And we ask that you would help us with that today. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me leave you with this thought. God has a perfect track record of keeping his promises. Leave here and be courageously obedient in the face of whatever fear is ahead of you. You are dismissed.